and during the COVID-19 pandemic, just how essential connection to the internet really is, and yet we still leave half the world on the sidelines. And that's why closing what people term the digital divide is so important, not just to that itself, but to other goals of equity and sustainable development, very much including uh, the future of the women of the world. And that's why we're here today to highlight the problem and some of the collaborations that are at work to make that divide even and ever narrower. And we've got an excellent panel on stage today. Uh, to my right, we have uh, Lenny Schultz. She is the uh, U.S. Operations and Business Development at lead at Bluetown, a global internet provider that seeks to close the digital divide. Next, we have Tim Pruitt. He's the president and CEO of the Hunger Project, a global movement of individuals and organizations working worldwide in authentic partnership with the sustainable end of hunger. Next, we have Vicki Robinson. She's the general manager of Microsoft's Airband Initiative, which has the goal of assisting uh, rural Americans to get affordably and, and elsewhere as well, affordably get online and access application services powered by Microsoft's cloud. And last we have Sonia George. She's the founder of the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership, also the executive director, I should have mentioned that. Um, a coalition of public, private, and civil society organizations working to bring together internet con connectivity to the global majority and ensure everyone is meaningfully connected by 2030. Um, so I just want to start, you know, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce yourselves and share a little bit about what your organization is working to do to bridge the digital divide. Um, and also, I think, why is this an issue you're passionate about? Um, Sonia, we can start with you. Sure, thank you. Uh, um, so first of all, thank you for having me here. Thank you, team, for inviting me into the Hunger Project. It's great to share the panel with all of you. Um, the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership, as you mentioned, we are a global coalition of public, private, and civil society organizations working together to solve these massive, massive problem that we have now in the world, especially in global majority countries, of not just lack of connectivity, so a massive amount of the population is unconnected, but also a serious concern around those who are uh, very poorly connected. So it's a combination of those two things. And of course, for us, you know, here we are at CSW, the Commission on the Status of Women uh, in New York, and the, the, the gender digital divide is also a major concern in that context. Should I keep going? I think so, good. Yeah. Okay. It's a major concern also um, in terms of um, the reality that we are facing. So for us, a couple of things are important in these contexts. One, uh, the fact that people remain excluded from all the opportunities that digital development can bring to their lives and their livelihoods. So when we think about these issues, we don't just think about these ideal of people coming online because everything that is online is good. Um, it's really about bringing true opportunities. Okay. It's really about um, bringing opportunities that are transformational in people's lives. So when we think about uh, people coming online, it's not, you know, entertainment is important, and I always like to say that because people do like to be entertained when they are online, but it's about being able to um, be entrepreneurs, knowing their rights, uh, participating in civic activities, having access to health care, having access to education opportunities, and really benefiting from these digital um, environment in a way that improves their lives, in a way that they can take full agency of how they embrace technology and uh, of course utilize it for themselves, their families, their communities. And so for us it's really concerning again that not only, uh, I like to say not just a few as you said, but actually half of the world is not connected, is completely excluded from these opportunities, but also, and this is another concern, that in the most recent years, especially post-pandemic and during the pandemic, the, the gap between those who have and don't have has widened. And um, it has created issues around affordability, around access, around the ability of people to also gain the right skills to use online opportunities in a way that's safe, private, that protects their own data, and that really allows them to feel comfortable. The last thing I want to hear are, you know, for example, groups of women that we work with saying, we are simply not just going to go online because there's just too much violence or too much harassment, and it's just too heavy of a toll 
to actually participate in digital life. So what we do is to uh, work with governments and private sector and civil society partners to really change that picture, to do everything that we can, especially from a policy and regulatory perspective, to change that picture and turn digital opportunity into real, the real opportunity that we want it to be. Thank you so much. Um, talking about private sector <coughs> partners, Vicky, can you talk a little bit about your role, Microsoft, Airband as well, in, in this entire problem? Absolutely, and it's great to be here. So um, I'm Vicki, and I lead the Microsoft Airband Initiative, which is actually global in um, and, and scope. And so our position and how we approach this work is that we believe that internet access is a fundamental right, and that's our North Star for how we approach the work. And so um, essentially what Microsoft is doing is part of our work to advance, not just only access to the internet, but meaningful connectivity. Um, not internet access, internet access in and of itself is not what's transformative, it's what's enabled uh, by having internet access and when we talk about meaningful connectivity. To Sonia's point, for us it's about being able to have the skills that are necessary uh, to operate online both safely and productively in a way that can be transformative for community, but also having as necessary devices, et cetera, that are, um, again, um, essential if you are able to actually, you know, participate online. Um, our approach is really a partnership approach. We work, we have a lot of partners here on this virtual stage with us, well, these virtual people mm -hmm. online. Um, but for us, partnership is, is, is core to what we do, and so our ecosystem of partners from the private sector, governments, nonprofits, civil society, et cetera, we're all aligned on work that we can do to address the global digital divide. And for us, we all know that there are several divides. Um, you mentioned kind of rural America, that's a, that's a component of our work, absolutely. And that's uh, Airband is specifically going where others are not going to address that divide uh, between rural communities and urban communities. But also there are several other divides. So we're also trying to reach people who are not typically reached. And so for us, our work to ensure that women and girls in particular and other disadvantaged works is center plate for uh, work that we're trying to do to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more, which is Microsoft's mission. Uh, so Airband's work around closing the, uh, the digital divide all up is both central to our corporate mission, but it's also aligned to our business interests. We are a technology company, and if you have a third, whether the figure is a third of the world or half of the world that's off, that's not able to, that's offline for whatever reason, um, that's an automatic limiter on our ability to, you know, have our technology be pervasive and um, even more fundamentally. Uh, democratizing technology and access is part of our DNA. So that's a little bit of the why um, we're in this space and the how. Um, the, the other point I would make for us, and it's related to this notion of meaningful connectivity, it's not about just having internet access. That's the foundation. For us, it's what the internet access enables. And so uh, for us, through our partners, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this as part of our time together, it's around how having this access can do things to improve productivity and livelihoods. Um, what's also incredibly important is building resilient and sustainable mm -hmm. communities and also having inclusive development. And so it's that inclusive development piece that's really relevant for us, particularly for women. Um, and girls, and so we're excited to be here to talk about this work and this moment in time at CSW and what we can do to really put some intention and actions behind getting at the problem. Thank you so much. Uh, Tim, tell us about the Hunger Project and actually how you, you all fit into this. And, yeah. You know, dealing with hunger is one thing. I mean, I'm very curious about how the digital divide and digital tools more generally sort of dovetail with that mission and yeah. the role of collaborators. Yeah, great. We, we are so aligned, and so I, I, I just want to appreciate our partners here that, that have these shared values which enable such a strong partnership. Uh, democratization of technology, gaining access, gaining access to resource, and as Vicki said, the, the meaningful access to technologies is, is such an important aspect of hunger. 
Many of the other SDGs too, our lens of looking at this through hunger is quite simply that to solve the challenge that we have of food security, of nutrition, to get where we need to go on the planet to make sure we have healthy, nutritious food for all, we need access to technology. We also need women leadership. Yes. We also need clean water. We also need access to health. Well, technology enables quite a bit of that, as you can imagine, in, in many different ways. So if I could paint a little picture, we have around 1 million people on the continent of Africa that are living in what we call an epicenter, which is a place where the communities come together. Uh, we're smiling because we know the places, they're very beautiful and yes. lots of celebration. The community comes together and they're able to chart their own path. The leadership there takes charge of where they would like to go with their community. You know, you can imagine it doesn't take long for people to say, hey, child mort mortality and, and other very critical aspects. Women are, are really determined to change this. Once the epicenter is in place, many of these communities get a healthcare worker for the first time, a nurse. This is in very remote areas. Uh, with Airband, we've, we've worked in Ghana uh, and Malawi. And what we see is, is really transition with the technology. So that healthcare provider can upload information and gain access to information. Not only do they have a healthcare provider, they've got a connected healthcare provider. So it's, it's a really um, unique and wonderful addition to decades of programming that is, is just enabled to do new uh, and different things. And I'll add that when we look at the future of food security on the planet, when we look at where hunger and nutrition is going, this is an urgency yes. to, to, for women to get access in the most remote, remote corners of the planet. You mentioned productivity. This is a one very important aspect and, and, and we're 100% behind the democratization expanding access to technology. Thank you so much. Um, tell me, that's you for Blue Town. Tell yeah. us about Blue Town and again your their, your company, so your role within this entire yeah. business. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So at Blue Town, we are a last mile internet service provider and also content service provider. Um, we operate in a few countries, mainly in India and also in Ghana, and have a few other things going on in other countries. But these are our major markets, and what we do is we offer traditional ISP services, we offer internet to homes, to businesses, to organizations, institutions, like universities or governments. Um, but our mission is to connect the unconnected. So that means the areas we work in are what we call peri-urban or rural communities. We work in communities here where we often encounter populations that are either underserved or unserved. Um, and that means that we often go in and connect communities that have not had internet before. <laughs> so with that comes responsibility. It's not just providing, well, affordable internet is sort of the first, <laughs> the first barrier we have to attack, right? To make sure that there is internet that is affordable to everybody. Um, and then the next phase is like how to make sure that we build that digital capacity and relevance to that internet within the, within those communities and. Our end goal as an as a content or an internet service provider is of course to make a business out of that. And and especially when we go into these rural communities, that's a long path towards sustainability as we call it. Um, but that's really the goal for us is that we get to a point where these communities are not dependent on on aid, <laughs> so to speak, because what we've seen time and time again is that when we do these projects where we provide internet for a period of time. Uh, the internet goes away when that project is over, right? So our work or mission is really to figure out how can we get to that point where, where we can actually sustain the internet beyond these projects. Um, and that takes um, economic development over time, and we believe that women are just a huge part of that. Um, I think there's a lot of, you probably know the research on that better, that if we empower women, we can, we can get there faster. Um, so yes. that's a huge part of, of um, you know, we'll start with you again, Sony, and, but I'd love other people to touch on this question as well. I mean, we, I think we've hit on some of the barriers, but what, what do you see as the biggest barriers to connectivity uh, when it comes to expanding broadband access? Um, you know, are they physical? I mean, literally, places, is it signal? Are, are, there, are there some soft skills? Is the ability to use it? And I'm just curious what, you know, what's, what's the biggest things that are getting in the way of getting to that goal that we all want to get? 
I mean, there's, there are several things, right? And it's not exactly just the, the clear picture everywhere. And it differs regardless of, you know, in different places, right? In different contexts, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, uh, depending on where you are. What I would say, and thank you, uh, Vicky, for highlighting meaningful connectivity, which is something that for us is core. Um, let me start with that. The way we see it about meaningful connectivity for the global majority, it's important to talk about that concept because it's about the quality of service. Mm -hmm. So it's going beyond accessing the physical that you were asking just now, but then having and ensuring that there is a certain quality that allows for things like what you were talking about, Tim, the healthcare services, the access to information, real time, fast, without creating any kind of concerns, stresses, and whatnot. So that is really important, having the quality that people you know, require to actually enjoy that digital experience. Now, do countries have that minimum quality? No, and in fact, one of the things that is really important to note is that when you think about all those statistics about how many people are online and whatnot, those are measured by how, you know, the number of people that have been online at least once in the last three months, okay? And I think that's a really important thing to note is that yes, it's good to kind of see that people experience that connection but with the online meaningful? world, but it's not meaningful. It doesn't go that far. Right. It doesn't allow them all these opportunities and especially ways of contributing to their livelihoods that we want to either through food, through services, you know, health, education, what have you. So meaningful connectivity is really important because it assures that level of quality that is required to benefit across all these different sectors and opportunities. Now, infrastructure remains an issue in many parts of the world. Absolutely. Um, and we need to invest. Uh, I always like to say, and people always get very surprised, I like to say we actually worked with the IPU a few years ago and, um, and also did a couple of other things around this concept of people-centered meaningful connectivity, including with colleagues here. And one of the things that we discovered is that it only would cost about $430 billion from now until 2030 to connect the, those that are unconnected to uh, meaningful connectivity, to have that kind of minimum threshold that then allows for this incredible benefit to be spread everywhere. That amount, which is very difficult to get and we just are not even close to it, it's not very, very large. 430 billion, if you think about it, it's very small. It's so small that I'll tell you is exactly the amount that the world spends on soda every year, on average. So think about food security and real nutrition. That's soda. So just to put in perspective. It's a powerful analogy. Mm. <laughs> exactly. Now, not only that. So this is all about the infrastructure piece. Now people also need to be able to use. We know I don't want to just tell people you have to use online. Here's a wonderful infrastructure. We need to make sure people are skilled. People understand how to use. They use it safely, privately, and all these uh, points that we already made. So it's a more complex story than just um, infrastructure or just affordability. It's actually uh, what we like to call the, the the whole context of meaningful access which has three kind of areas. And one of them, so affordability, the connectivity piece, the quality, but then the social and environmental issues that allow for that connectivity to then to become even more meaningful, right? And so, and that comes, it's issues around skills, around, uh, of course, all the other items that we just mentioned, privacy and security, but also importantly, more so than ever, um, our impact as an industry on climate and on planet. So part of doing all of these is also thinking about are we in, um, deploying and investing in infrastructure in a way that is going to be using renewable energy, in a way that is going to be thinking about the impact. Are we pushing for, for example, devices? Devices are a very critical element of meaningful connectivity, right? Um, what happens around the world is that women tend to have the poorest devices, the cheaper devices, or and no also device. the ones, or no device, and the devices that don't have the functionality for all of these possibilities that we're talking about. But we also need to be conscious that devices have an environmental cost, right? 
and we need to extend the, the, the life of devices, but most importantly, make them available to people at first, but also worrying about these things. And so I think to answer your question, it's not a simple answer. It's this complex set of issues that we really need to work on all of them in tandem to really get to a point where meaningful connectivity and this concept of everyone having you know, a, a basic access that is good enough is really a reality. But it, it, So we're working on that. And what we uh, focus on with countries that we work on around the world is the policy pieces that are important to get that started. So that, and this is something that all of you here actually have faced, you know, often countries don't even have the regulations in place to allow alternative providers, community providers. Um, usually it's the large oper uh, you know, operators that have licenses, and it's a lot of work to make sure that they have a system in place that not only welcomes, but incentivizes you know, other kinds of uh, service provision that will then provide services to rural areas, very urban areas, and others. So we work on that and we help them with the implementation of that to get there, but again, all of these pieces have to work in tandem, and this is why it requires partnership, because we cannot all do everything, um, and so working together as partners is absolutely critical. Um, was it, Vicky, you talking about partnerships, and you, you collaborate with people and groups on the stage right here, and you mentioned, obviously, Airband has US, but also has international components, international projects. Could you just like walk me through uh, one of those projects? How it came together, what it's able to do on the ground. I, would love I know, to. yes, please. <laughs> and to be clear, you know, um, the lion's share of our work is actually outside the United mm -hmm. States, right? Um, and um, and I, I want to kind of back into your question by addressing some points that some raised here. I think um, we started when we started Airband. Um, we had some ideas and some theories about how, you know, what's required to use to get service so that it's affordable. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of on the access side. And so, you know, what kind of technology set can be used? Um, what kind of technologies can we deliver services in an affordable manner, in a cost-effective manner, mm -hmm. so that the internet service provider can then get a, a reasonable return and actually the services can be sustainable. So. I want to say, um, kind of, and I and you can kind of see this through one of our examples. You can, I think of oftentimes people think about the digital divide as a kind of a, you know, it's a kind of a black and white right. situation, on or, off, right? on or off, and it's it's so much more complex than that. Um, you can't assume that if you build it, people will come. Um, what become very clear to us in doing this work for the past five plus years is that. Uh, to you have to first get the infrastructure in place so that people can actually take advantage of it. And as I saw through our work in Ghana, this is hyper local. Mm -hmm. You know right. what's going to work in uh, you know in very rural areas in the country of Ghana is going to be very different than what's required in I don't know you know Colombia. Sure. And so this work is hyper local, and to actually have. Um, the work being meaningful for those communities, you need local partners. And so um, my first trip, um, I, I did used to lead our Airband US, but my first trip, um, my first initiation into our work outside the United States was my trip to Ghana. And I was able to visit a project where Bloomtown and the Hunger Project are working together. And what was so transformative about that model is you have, you know, Blue Town as the last mile provider, providing Wi-Fi access to communities, but also making it available to homes. And then you have this epicenter, and you were able to see so many things. I was able to see through my time there, but you saw the importance of, you know, these organizations locking arms to be able to see what's needed in these communities, and. Um, kind of you see all these, these various divides together. One thing that's important, I talked about kind of in my opening remarks, we're going where others are not going and we wanna serve people who are not being served. Typically, um, when you're talking about groups that are historically marginalized, they are usually um, uh, people who are income, food insecure, um, uh, they are women and girls, 
um, they connect with people with disabilities. And so you see all of that and then this effort center model, you're able to reach people at where they, where they are. And so um, we saw that having like banking, access to banking, you saw women kind of in lead in the community. You saw uh, local people, uh, Blue Town coming in and providing access to jobs and to training and to skilling. And so um, that was a big learning for me is that uh, this work has to be, is very local and personal. You need to have this collaboration, this ecosystem approach where partners are coming together to say, what are the specific needs of this community and how do we go after it? And it's really just changed my whole approach to this work. No, no single solution set. You gotta have people who are local, who know the needs of that community. You can't come in and say, I know what you need at Microsoft and Redmond. No, it's really very specific and it requires you to have the, that local partner, who, who partners who are trusted um, and valued. And so it's, again, that trip really just changed my whole approach. Like this work is very local and very personal. Um, and that has to be uh, something that's infused into your work if you are to show communities that it's relevant in the first place and to build sustainable models. Um, could, you say, I thought you just said you wanted to call Oh yeah, please. Um, I, I think this is such an important point in all the work that we do in our digital sector, as we call it. And I want to point out that this is also very important at the policy and regulatory level, which often people miss. And um, one of the reasons why in our work it's been, we've been able to do things not just differently, but also I would say more effective, they take a lot more time and a lot more care, is exactly that kind of very custom, very focused approach to question. And I think what Vicky was saying, for example, when you apply that to policy, uh, in general, the sector, people tend to say, well, you know, there's a model in Colombia, there's a model in Kenya. Let's try to replicate that in, say, Ghana or Mozambique or Benin. It doesn't work. At the policy level as well, because there are different levels of development, different approaches, different local ways of working. And I just want to point out, this is such an important piece to any kind of development solutions, as you know, working in development. Also, I'm sure it's true in in the hunger project related work, policymakers have to be smarter about that public service. Who are you serving? How are you serving? If you don't ask that question and localize it, we tend to miss it. And this is why often a lot of policy work that is done at the very national level misses those local needs. And it stays kind of in this aggregate that it just doesn't go as far, right? It just doesn't go as far as it can go. So I just wanted to point that out. I think that's a really that's something that we need to remind ourselves that is so critical for everything that happens um, in the sector. Um, let me ask you. You, um, you mentioned something. You're talking about like, like local local approaches, local solutions. You you said last mile. You know, and I'm familiar with that term from healthcare providing. Um, I think you know from even like economics delivery to a certain extent. What does it mean when it comes to that? I mean, is that literally like like what, what is the last mile when it comes yeah. to something that is as ephemeral as well as a cyber space? That's a good question. Um, so I think in, in general, you would call last mile, you often talk about the infrastructure, right? Like we bring the, we bring the internet to the devices. Okay. Um, but I think when it, we talk about it in the context of these rural communities where there's so many other aspects, um, the way that we are, are trying to solve that is first and foremost working with partners that, that can help in all kinds of areas of that space. But what we try to provide is, uh, we call it a rural connectivity platform, so that we basically deliver sort of the basic services that partners and that we can work with partners to build around. And part of that is of course the infrastructure first and foremost. Um, but then it's also a matter of we're talking about building competencies. Who is going to do that? So we work with local operate. We call them micro operators. They're basically local local agents that can be that first line of support uh, that can help with the initial digital literacy training. And from there on, like that's what we experience is that's the first that's the first entry point is sort of just bring people onto the internet for the first time. That's a big step. 
Uh, but then from there on, we see that these agents also develop over time and start developing other training courses because there's suddenly a demand for more knowledge and more, ex more input. So that micro-operator is, is also part of our solution. We have uh, something we call a local cloud. Um, and one issue is often that um, we call about we talk about meaningful connectivity. Right. So it's about find, figuring out what what that content is that is meaningful for people to access early on. And we also talk about meaningful connectivity in that we need a certain speed and it has to be a quality of speed. But the problem, the issue is just it's just not always like we experience internet in the city like we are in right now. So so if you can have what the way that we have access uh, local content is that. People can access this content locally, meaning that they can access it through the network on their devices, but they don't have to go onto the internet. Mm -hmm. So that means that you can actually you can have much higher quality content. You can have video, uh, mm -hmm. high quality video, which is extremely important in these in these areas, and maybe particularly for women, um, there's a lot, there's a high um, rate of illiteracy. So it's n it's not just enough to let people onto Google because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know what or can't do anything with that. Um, so that's part of it. The devices, figuring out how can we make sure we get device, devices into these communities in different ways, working with partners that have local um, financial institutions so we can make these uh, lease to own models where women or people in general can, can buy these devices over time. Um, yeah, so it's, it's providing that platform and then work with partners to make sure that we get all of these aspects. I would just add on to that too, and it's based on kind of a learning for us. So when you're talking about these rural, hard to serve areas versus urban, and peri-urban versus urban, um, when we think about what the last mile is, it's like, you know, the last mile like to the home or right. to the center. Right. I just wanted to kind of, you know, clarify that point. And um, <clears throat> what's typically easier to do is to kind of go to the city. Um, and you can do, and, and, and then in kind of in telecom speak, you think about like backbone networks and last mile right. networks. And so what we're talking about, and this is a learning for us, is that what if you can get them both together, yeah. right? And you can make the cost of reaching the home, the school, et cetera, more cost effective if you can actually kind of pair a blue town with say a biosat. Um, they are a massive, you know, satellite company and a recent airband mm -hmm. partner. Um, but that was something that we had never done before. But we're like, we can empower, like under this hub and spoke model, all of our partners, Hunger Project, Nissan Road, Blue Town, et cetera, if you're able to kind of take these large networks that have massive coverage and allow our last mile provider to connect to that network to more cost effectively serve consumers. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we think about then. And then they're able to do the thing yeah. that Linda talked about, like, you know, open up the possibilities around content that's relevant and think about how to really kind of cater to those local solutions, working with the Hunger Project, et cetera. It's really this ecosystem approach, but it's part of that last mile and why it's, it's proved to be elusive is that it's not really typically cost effective. And you need the regulations in place to kind of allow for a myriad of, te myriad of technology solutions to be able to reach last mile cost effective. And I often talk about it sort of in the context of you can sort of compare it with power power projects, right? Like you bring a solar system to a rural village and it changes their yes. world. Yeah. The issue with internet is you bring the internet, but you still have that constant cost because you have to bring right. the internet all the time. Right? That's right. Yeah. So that backhaul, um, getting to those agreements with backhaul providers is so important because yes. it's a huge cost, Absolutely. Uh, added cost. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Tim, I want to ask you, you know, just a, how the Hunger Project is in this particular collaboration, just to keep that focus in there. But you know, also, <laughs> hunger is pretty much the very bottom of the human pyramid of needs. I mean, that's the first thing we need. You know, so tell me a little bit more about like, how being involved in this project, these kind of projects, fits into that mission, especially with that eye towards gender. And, and also, mindful, you know, um, we talked about sort of the, the divide growing somewhat bigger during the pandemic. Well, I think hunger became a bigger problem uh, as well. So, yes. just how the, all these things fit together in your mind. Yeah, great. Well, first of all, I just want to say the, the, the meaningful access that, that we're all speaking about requires so much social infrastructure as well. I mean, many of you had mentioned it as well. And, and I think what we've seen are communities coming out when, for example, we had access in Malawi, and yet 
the women were not using it as much as the men, sometimes for social reasons, uh, gender roles. There's a, a variety of reasons, cost. And so we began experimenting with reducing the cost, taking cost out of the equation, having women come in and working with different models to help enable that access. Now, why is this so important for food and hunger? I, I read a, a uh, imaginary statistic a few years ago. The reason it's imaginary is because there's no way this is accurate. <laughs> but the trend is right. 70% of the world's food is grown by women. There's no way you can measure that. Okay, let's, right. let's be honest. Right. There's, it's not possible. But, but we do know that on the world's small farms, of which there are 500 million, when you look farm by farm and you take a sample, you see the labor being done by women to be extraordinary compared to what the men do. I wish it was different, but that's the way it is. <laughs> so at the end of the day, have women having access to technology is gonna help in very specific reasons. Four years ago, full army worm came through the Horn of Africa and destroyed yeah. crops. People went hungry immediately. Mm -hmm. If there was an early warning system for that, yeah. they would have saved thousands of lives. And so that's just one small example. I think what's even more interesting is looking at food of the future and how we're gonna grow food going forward with the strain on our natural environment, getting equity and access mm -hmm. is so, because the inequity now will only be exacerbated once our food system expands and changes with technology. Go ahead, please. I'm, I'm just gonna yeah. add something. I, a few years ago, we were doing um, field work in rural Mozambique, and you just reminded me of these experiences just to kind of link to the infrastructure questions as well. And um, there was this plan to extend um, the you know, fiber network, the kind of you know backhaul network, the backbone actually, in the place. And, and the plan was to extend it through what traditionally are the transport corridors, because you know telecom operators and countries tend to think about those corridors as like the main kind of think about it. You know, it's like our heart, right? You have the center, you have some strong cap, you know, veins, and then capillaries. Right. Well, it turns out that all of the economic activity along the transport corridors were dominated by men because those were the traders. Women were not allowed to be traders in those communities. And, but, as you were saying, they were the main food producers. Mm -hmm. So this was creating, and this was happening, and we were watching it real time. So not only did women not have access to the cell phones to be able to know when to take their products to market. They became fully dependent on the man that owned the cell phones to know when they could take their products to market. And they were the ones controlling most of the revenue from selling the food because they were the ones who could participate in these economic activity along these transport corridors. Because with transport, not only people could have access, you know, some people, and then there was this constant business, right? So by default, putting that infrastructure along these corridors excluded the women producers of food, not just for them to continue to, they wanted to continue to produce, but actually selling product, they couldn't. They were completely excluded from that ex equation. So this is how these things actually come together. You just reminded me, Tim. I remember uh, in, in those days, like well, we can do these we have to bring it in you have you can't just focus on the corridors you have to be bring the infrastructure where women are where those producers are so that they can continue to feed their communities but also have a revenue generate generating opportunity because they were the main producers so I mean does that underscore the idea that when we again think of this from a gender lens specifically that enabling that kind of access to digital tools to, to the internet itself like can help shake up those long existing relations i mean like those long existing networks in a way that can enable more fairness again thinking about about gender i mean people who you know giving you access giving the ability to sell perhaps or have that information just as we sort of consider this as something that also moves towards a goal of gender equality is that kind of how it works in your mind so, sorry, 
absolutely. I'm sure you all have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we're in a digital world. And so being able to have and to kind of level the playing field from an access perspective is a way that you can begin to do that level of the playing field. And so we're seeing this in our work where women are able, you know, through our shopkeepers and dukas, where they actually have access to connectivity, making like female entrepreneurship. Um, we met a woman um, when, when we were in Ghana, and we had, um, and she was a leader and a pillar in that community, in that, the epicenter. And we hosted it, and as she was able to, you know, earn a livelihood and become profitable, it was a flywheel effect. So as you look, as you lift up women, you lift entire communities. Um, and I may be biased saying this, but we are the back, you know, thinking of backbone. Women are the backbone of society. And as we are able to ensure that women are able to be connected and to do it productively, that's how we change the world. Um, you know, one one small place at a time. I'm convinced of it. Yeah, I'm just at a lot of the places we work. There's a community around this and a communal culture. I think technology is highly individualized in our country, right? And so when you look at you, you know some of the things you mentioned about that you write about at Vox, the negative side, okay. you know, when a community get a hold gets a hold of the technology and they embrace it as a community, they manage it differently too. Yes. And I actually think there's when it comes to gender equity, when it comes to access, even for paying for it until the four hundred and thirty billion shows up. We, we, I think we could really look at some of the community governance models, some of the work. I mean, we can actually learn a lot from that yes. and take some of it on here. I mean, but to your point, I mean, yes, there are, in some areas, it's not so easy. I mean, right. in general, yes, this is what we want to see, but there are some places that there's a struggle, you know, because of social and cultural norms, you yes. know, of power and power dynamics of how women can and cannot and how to have access to technology. I, what we've seen is that as technology is embraced mm -hmm. and communities, including men, who tend to you know, want to keep their power intact, uh, have seen not the all. benefit. Not all. <laughs> not in, some of the communities, in some of the communities where this is an issue, right? Uh, I mean, I'm kind of generalizing, but it's really important. I mean, this is one of the things that's actually being very tricky here at the CSW document as to how to tweak the language to recognize these issues. But mm -hmm. um, in, in areas where there's been plenty of um, evidence that when women are given these opportunities, the whole community, the families benefits, then those power dynamics are starting to right. change right. because men to an other you know, community leaders are realizing, oh, this actually works for everyone. Exactly. Because women, as Vicky was saying, when women, you know, take on these things, everyone benefits. Mm -hmm. And I think and, and, and that's yeah. really critical. Absolutely. And I yep. think that's where the partnerships come in, like the work we do with you at the Hanga Project, for instance, is that you already have that foundation of providing that basic uh, women empowerment training to men and women, right, mm -hmm. uh, in these communities. And then it's just, it seems at least in communities like that, where there's been sort of work done already, that it's easier to get to that point, right, where as soon as men see that there's an opportunity to improve their livelihood through technology, they're probably also more prone to encourage their wives and their children to learn digital skills or to work on their entrepreneurial businesses uh, in a digital way. So I think that that's just one of the one of the sort of examples of how important these partnerships are. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. There's a lot of aspects to this work, but just the simple fact of requiring 50% of the communities Council to be women, women mm -hmm. is exactly. a game changer. Yeah. Just, game changer. just that simple, yeah. simple statistic. But um, you know, we, it was interesting. What comes to mind is our work in Malawi, where uh, they've had terrible trouble with electricity in rural Malawi. Mm -hmm. and of course, no electricity, no access. And our the communities where that leadership is strong were able to voice to the government in a more effective way and get more access to power than some of the other communities. And the load shedding that's going on there is, is extreme. They're exactly. losing a lot. In South Africa as well. Same. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's really bad. But, but they are exporting power to some mm -hmm. countries. So that's a difference. That's but, a difference. Yeah. yeah. So but. I just wanted to share another kind of, um, just for the conversation, because I think these things are really helpful. 
another statistic that you know we um, another estimate from our cost of exclusion report that we did um, just about two years ago a year and a half ago and we estimated that the economic consequence of the digital gender gap was about was about a trillion dollars in just the last decade and I, I want to point that out because it's not just about us having, like you were mentioning early, empathy, wanting to do good, and you know, wanting to just think about technology for good. I think there's a really strong economic and social argument behind, you know, digital equality and digital inclusion and meaningful connectivity. And the fact that the world has lost this opportunity is quite sad. I mean, we we are all part of that problem, right? We need to change that. And if we don't change, you know, there's an opportunity loss until 2025 of another over 500 billion that we cannot create, that we cannot produce um, if women continue to be excluded. And I think that's really important to remember that because as you were saying, women are key producers, key members of the community and society, and if we don't allow and if we don't create the conditions for women to fully exercise their agency as creators, thinkers, entrepreneurs, you know, family members, what have you. We're gonna continue losing big time, um, you know, over and over and over again. We cannot afford that. Countries, you know, global majority countries, meaning low and low middle income countries, are losing massive tax revenues because of this exclusion too. So it's an economic argument. And I and to me that's a really important point to make. Um, that because it links with everything else that we are doing. Because governments, in the end, are the ones who are going to help us make these happen, right? If we don't have their buy-in, if we don't have their support, our work, you know, stays very limited. So we need to help them see these arguments, see these, uh, these data, so they see the loss opportunity, the opportunity cost of not taking action on these issues. Um, including the digital gender divide, but overall, you know, meaningful connectivity to their population. So I just wanted to make that point because I think that's really important to put, you know, that in perspective. Um, I want to make sure we touch on something with, you know, which is there, there is, of course, the infrastructure, everything around trying to bring the internet close that divide. There's also the, the skill side on those who are going to be being connected. And um, I'm not sure if you're to talk about this actually, but uh, I'm curious, like, how do we build digital literacy skills so that women and girls, girls girls especially, they can leverage that benefit of the internet, do it in a healthy, effective, and safe way. You know, what, what's who, who instructs that and where does that come to play? I love what you all are doing in the emphasis. Yes. You should mm -hmm. talk about that scaling. Well, I, you know, our, our, um, our work, communities that are building around an epicenter, that are developing the way they want to develop, oftentimes they really want to gain access and We've actually put a few computer labs up, thanks to our partners. Uh, these have been incredibly well received. When I was in Malawi, I sat next to a woman who had never been online, let alone sat in front of a computer. And it's just, a world opens up. There were some younger people in the computer lab. Uh, one was doing quantum mechanics. And I was like, wow. what, what? I don't even know what quantum mechanics is. is. I work at Microsoft. Right? And so it was, it was it, you know, and, and there's also stuff like, People downloading sewing patterns, and right. you know, a musician that was gaining access to kind of new, new beats and everything. So it's really, really, um, there's just a, a lot there. And again, looking at the at this as a community project, where there is some instruction, okay, there is some, uh, but also curiosity forms, and then others see what others are doing, and then it it kind of. It, builds on, on what's already there. I would say though, um, probably the, the immediate access to health information uh, is really compelling. And we had a cholera outbreak in Ghana and the alert went across. They would not have known. Uh, and they were able to take preventative measures uh, before it reached the community and again, save thousands of lives. So um, there, there's, there's so many, many ways uh, that communities can get meaningful information. And of course, there is always entertainment, right? Sure. It's always there. 
Um, but um, I think the, you know, we are, I don't know what you guys do with your phones, but I tend to, you know, <laughs> order food, play games right. and chat. You know, I, I think that there's not, we don't have a big range. Mm -hmm. And remember, M-Pesa developed online currency in Kenya. Mm -hmm. I, I think the range of which the uses, people are much more open to that meaningful connection uh, than we are here. Or maybe we're just staring down the same pipes and so we get the same same content. I well, I think it's, just, it's, it's intriguing, you know, to, to so much of the conversation now is about worries about the, the, the problematic effects of tech, what does it do with your children, you know, yeah. and it's sort of, to have this conversation kind of brings me back to a time in the past where it felt so much more open, and it kind of reminds you of that, those potential, that possibilities, and what, what this this digital promise was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's so great to see that, and I guess, um, I, mean, I want to ask you, you know, when it comes to, we, we talked a little about working with government, I mean, how do you, you know, you, you have to do that, but how, how do you build a sustainable business out of this, I suppose, yeah. actually, is a better question, because that ultimately is the point here, like, hey, you can only go so far. I think we've seen past efforts on sort of technology in, in initiatives that, as you say, you bring it in, and then how long does it last, there's a maintenance issue. So how, how do you build a sustainable business out of this that will last for the long term? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's work in progress also for us, yeah. especially in these very rural communities, right? It's, it's, not, it's not an easy path and it's something that will take time. And I don't know exactly if we, we know, that we know exactly what that is yet um, and how long time exactly it will take in these communities. But there has to be support from the get-go and that's, yeah. that's just the way it is. And I'm not sure how long that is um, until we get built this competency and this, this capacity within the, organi the, the businesses. Um, so it is a long road and where we work with these partnerships and then one way, one thing that we are also trying to look into or work with is how can we make sure that that these, the local population doesn't have to carry the brunt of the cost also over time even when we are at a point where we don't get donors right. involved anymore. And one way I talked about our, our local cloud, for instance, is looking into what can other business models look like where there are people from outside that are also supporting <laughs> the connectivity. Um, and one, one way we are working now is to work with organizations or governments or others that want to disseminate content into these communities. And now we come into an area where, yeah, where we, we can also, this can be for good or for bad, right? Okay. So that's, that's our job <laughs> is to be on, on that side. But, um, so for instance, we are working with uh, Siemens and the German government right now on a project where they are interested in, in accessing students uh, onto their uh, education platform. And there is probably a business model around that somehow that we can ensure that, that there's, there's revenue being generated from outside the community that benefits into the community. So that's one thing. Um, and of course, over time, we want these communities to get to that economic development. We want to see that they actually benefit from the internet in a way that over time that they can also afford to buy internet. Um, that's that's what we're working toward. One thing is the lease to own model of the phones right now where we already work with the with the local microfinance institute and they've actually created a business around that, right? And then and as part of that business they need connectivity so they will be buying them. I was going to say one yeah. model that I really thought maybe we can, you can mention yeah. is Moingo in, uh, yeah. in Kenya. I mean, one of the things that I really like about it is that they've proven really well what a lot of people were doubting was not just the system, sustainability piece, but also the fact that rural communities, they, that we were assuming, including the government, rural communities were not interested in paying for the service. Yeah. And I think the way their business model worked with your partnership it actually proved them wrong. And I'll let you speak to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I have Moingo in mind too, because Moingo, uh, for those who may not know, is one of our, is our, very, our very first partner. And to you know think about like, some of this work to turn to profitability is patience. Um, but I think the Moingo partnership is interesting um, because it does take this whole society approach. You have some private investment, you have some public investment, you have regulations in place that allow for innovative solutions to, de to deliver service in a cost-effective manner. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a role for government, there's a role for the private sector and civil society to all come together. And so 
just to see New England kind of where they start and where they are today and expanding and you know being able to take these things and build the business model and doing things in a way where you you know they've kind of shown that it's okay and it can be profitable to focus on women to have a gender lens as part of your work it can be um, you know profitable to kind of you know have this steady kind of work and you know adapt and take in learnings and so that was one thing else as you were talking Lena is that um, it does help to have there is a role for government here um, and I think about um, you know I spent a lot of time in government prior to coming to Microsoft and you know we do a lot of work with USAID and they are just so nimble and agile and can you know want to roll up their sleeves and talk and work with us and our partners around you know what can we do around you know whether it's providing stuff through our digital invest and how you might um, be able to provide connectivity to these anchor institutions and then as a way to kind of incentivize um, providers and make it more cost effective to serve actual end user customers, right? Or focusing on gender and so, and then we, we you kind of take this seed investment from a private sector and we go back to New England in that example, and then what that can actually lead to with kind of, you know, learnings along the way but kind of like the steady pace of you know we're going to be we're going to learn um we're going to adapt and we're going to continue to grow um, but it does take this whole society approach to really make it work in the long term and i think for us it's also important that we work in the span of communities so i say from yes. very urban to rural mm -hmm. and what i'm talking about here is the very rural community right, and right, very right. small communities mm -hmm. and there's just a long path to sustainability there, and we're we are in on that ride. That's right. Uh, but there are, of course, other communities where it's easier for us to provide home broadband services. Right. There's lots of anchor institutions that we can connect and get to sustainability much much quicker. Yeah. Tim, let me ask you. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think you mentioned USAID, and this sort of got me thinking. You know, is this issue on a potential divide, especially taking it through a gender lens? Is it high enough on, I guess, the international agenda when it comes to aid more broadly because again a lot of priorities out there we yeah. have hunger we have health we have poverty we have access to energy which is pretty key to this too but you know when you look at this as a, as a holistic picture with all those different demands at this moment especially again after the pandemic when there was a lot of stress put in these systems and a little bit of backsliding on all of those goals mm -hmm. just do, do you think it's up there sufficiently yeah mind? yeah i think if anything the um the pandemic accelerated our um understanding how important it is to be connected right. in, in, in so many ways. Um, but at the same time, when you look at, um, uh, let's take a couple, a couple headlines in aid and development, like when uh, Ukraine blockages, you know, triple the price of fertilizer yeah. and, mm -hmm. and food, food prices went up around the world. I think the, the media coverage, the immediate response is more about how do we feed people now, now? And our, our peers and friends at places like USAID that, like us, have a development trajectory mindset that's more in decades is more about prioritizing and investing. So I think it's there. I think the challenge actually was brought out by this panel really nicely, and that is how do you pay for it? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, the $430 billion over here and. Lenny and I are rubbing nickels together to try to get it connected. So there, there's a big gap there. And you know, I, I just love the, the takeaway for me today is Vicki saying, this is a human right. And access needs to be there for everyone. And, and that to me, working collectively towards that goal, including the financial models to make it happen, uh, is if this, this CSW with the emphasis on technology and inclusion, I, I, my hope is that the world will come away with this vision firmly in mind and, and take it to the next level.